Hi fellows and welcome back to my YouTube channel and in this video we're going to be talking about the Brixton 125, the 150 or the 250 cc. It doesn't really matter which one it is and we all have the same question and I've been asked many times what can we do to improve the performance of the engine? Can we make the engine more powerful? And the answer is without any doubt yes. But I'll need to talk to you about a few things before I can tell you what can be done. Now the question is, can we actually implement it? That's another question and I'm still investigating on how to change the fuel map on the ECU of the Brixton. So, so far I'm making progress and as soon as I have a good outcome, I may actually produce a new fuel map. But you need to be aware of all the issues that surround that. The other question that I get often is like, oh, my Brixton doesn't perform anymore like it used to. It seems like I don't have the same power anymore. So how can I troubleshoot this? Well, the second part of this video will be all about the troubleshooting the loss of power on the standard Brixton 125 or 150 or 250 cc. And I'll give you some practical tips. I'll give you a demonstration on how I troubleshoot it. We'll do some live measurements, all things you can do yourself uh, back home in your own garage or workshop. So anyway, if you have any comments or recommendations, please feel free to do so. So let's start with why the Brixton has the power it has and why it doesn't have more. And I prepared already something on the blackboard here. And let me zoom in so I can start to explain it to you. As I've shown in a previous video, the Brixton engine is provided with an ECU and it's the engine control unit. And the engine control unit is responsible for dosing the amount of fuel that will be injected into the cylinders. And it does that by driving a solenoid on the injector which is mounted on the intake manifold. And if you don't know where these things are, then have a look on my previous video because it's all there. Now, first of all, uh, we have to make sure that the amount of fuel that is injected is efficient, that it provides sufficient power and that it is environmental friendly. So folks, uh, let's start why our Brixton has the power it has. So first of all, our Brixton has to comply with environmental conditions. Secondly, we want to have sufficient power and third, we have to have fuel efficiency. So there are, those are three main points that always need to be considered when you're creating a fuel map on an ECU. And that's what Brixton actually did. They found the perfect compromise, which we call the stoichiometric value, which is 14 parts of fuel and one part of air. We call this the air to fuel ratio. That's the point that Brixton is focusing on because it's the ideal point where there are no fuel particles left in the exhaust. But as you can see, it is nor full power, which would mean running the engine rich, nor is it highly efficient, that would mean running the engine lean, or it's not environmental friendly in full. You can't have one and all the other ones, you always have to make a compromise. Now that's what Brixton did. So remember, um, environmental conditions are very important, uh, certainly in Europe and in the US. And if you're running the engine rich, so lots of power, then you're going to create a lot of carbon monoxide and you're going to create a lot of hydrocarbon, gases that are very bad for the environment and are very strictly controlled in control techniques when you take your bike to the control in case you have a control technique. You could, on the other hand, uh, decide to run very efficient, so very lean, then those two gases will be dramatically reduced, but the nitrogen oxides will shoot up like crazy. And that's bad as well. So you need to find a compromise somewhere in between. And the 14 to 1 year to fuel ratio is the perfect point whereby the carbon oxide and the hydrocarbon gases are almost nil and there's a bit of NOx. <clears throat> so that's why the ECU is tuned in such a way that the amount of fuel injection is properly dosed around the 14 to 1 ratio. Alright, now let's have a look on, on the side here uh, what it means for us. 
What I've shown here is a curve, right? We have the power uh, axe and then we have the air to fuel ratio. Now if you look on this, then you will see that the fuel consumption is going in a curve like this, whereby you have maximum fuel consumption when you have lots of power and you're running rich. You have minimum fuel consumption around this point and that point is a calculator, well calculated point if you run on standard fuel, which is an air to fuel ratio of 15 to 1. Well, actually, it's 15.4 to 1, and that's the ideal point for minimum consumption and the most efficient use of the engine. But guess what? If you pull that point up, you see you're sitting on the power curve, you're sitting very low, so you won't have a lot of power. So, um, if we want to have lots of power, then we have to modify the fuel map in the way that we would be ending up over here. Now, that would mean we would be running about 12.6 of units of air versus one unit of fuel. So we're running very, very rich. If you do that, then you'll have lots of power, but have a look what happens with your fuel, fuel consumption. We went from this point all the way up here. So now you're gonna start consuming far more fuel, and what I have not shown is the effect of the, on the environment. So if you're running in this point, you're going to have a lot of carbon dioxide and a lot of uh, HC. If you're running on this point, so you want to be very fuel efficient, then you'll have a lot of NOx gases. And that's not good. So the middle point is over here. This is where the middle point is. So that's what Brixen has done. They went for a 14 to 1 fuel, uh, air to fuel ratio, right? Which happens to be the stoichiometric point. This is the point. So we have low fuel consumption, a moderate amount of CO, HC and NOx, acceptable for the environment. And then obviously we have power. Do we have the full power? No, we don't. We can increase the power if we were to modify the fuel map. So this is how that bike is set up. So if we are able to modify the fuel map of the ECU, then we can tune all this. Now the fuel map of the ECU is a very complex matter. It's going to be looking at RPMs, if you demand throttle or not. It will be looking at the temperature of the engine, it will be looking at the throttle position, it will be looking at the manifold absolute pressure, it will be looking at the crankshaft positioning, it will be looking at the oxygen sensor or the lambda, and I'll come back to the lambda in a minute because that's what I'm going to show you, how you can check that out. So it needs to consider all that and basically the ECU will inject the right amount of fuel with a target of 14 to 1. That's what it's going to do. Now, the feedback mechanism on your Brixton is actually this weird sensor that you have on your exhaust. This is the lambda sensor or the oxygen sensor and that's the one that's going to feed back the information to the ECU saying, hey, you're sitting at this point or at that point or whatever point that you're sitting, it will report the actual air to fuel ratio back to the ECU and the ECU will then adjust constantly to stay around this magic point here. So that's what this is all about guys. So this is why you don't have all the power on that engine that you would expect. So if we are able to change the ECU fuel map then we can play with the curves and we can affect it and we can actually produce more power. Now that is not easy. Um, I'm still trying to read out the fuel map on that ECU and once I've been able to read it out then maybe and just maybe we can interpret it and we can start playing around and program a new fuel map in the ECU. So that will be a bit the trick but remember if I'm going to do so or you will do so you will have to give in on your budget because you're going to use more fuel if you're going to run more in the rich environment because that's where you want to be, more power. You, you will have to get um, more fuel consumption, that's for sure. And you're going to have an issue with the environmental conditions because you will have a lot of CO and HC. But if you don't care about all that and if you only drive occasionally, why not? Just go for it. All right. 
So that's it. I will keep you posted on the fuel map and if I have one, I will post it for sure. But now let's look at a practical check on your uh, Brixton. Now assuming that you have a Brixton and for some reason it doesn't perform anymore like it used to, you feel like you have loss of power that it doesn't pick up anymore, then there is one very important check you can do and that is checking the oxygen sensor or the air to fuel ratio sensor which is sitting on the exhaust. Now let me show you where that is and then we'll start talking about it. So the air to fuel ratio sensor is sitting right here on the exhaust system and it's connected with four wires uh, going to the ECU. Now you cannot disconnect the wires over here because there's no connector because it's molded on there. The connector is sitting upwards underneath the gas tank and that's where I will actually put the probe on. Now there's two things we're going to do with this and I'll explain you that in a minute. Okay folks, so now we're getting to the practical part. You've seen the um, sensor on the exhaust and this is a representation of the sensor. You have inside the sensor a what we call a heater element, so it's a resistor and the resistance should be 9.6 ohms plus uh, minus 1.5 ohms. So basically between 11 and 8 ohms should be good enough. This um, resistor needs to be heated up and it's heated up under the control of the ECU. So there's a heater voltage on pin C and the return is on pin D. You will, f if you follow the cable, which is starting at the oxygen sensor and it goes all the way underneath the gas tank, you will find a connector and I'll show it to you in a minute. And that connector you have to disconnect. And when you disconnect it, the part that's going to the sensor, if you look into the pins, you will see that there are two kind of plastic lips on the bottom. And then you can look at the pins and it's A, B, C, D, which is matching up the A, B and the C and the D. So uh, the first thing we need to do is to make sure that this heating element is working. Because if the heating element is not working, then your sensor is not going to work properly and your bike won't have the proper performance. So quite often the heating element is broken and then you need to replace the sensor. Now to do that, you need to do a continuity check and therefore you're going to need an ohmmeter. Uh, and an ohmmeter is a very cheap, cheap thing. You can get it for about 20, 30, 40 euros, maybe even less, but make sure you have an ohms reading. So we'll dial it to the ohms reading as low as possible. And then we're going to measure between those two pins, right? Uh, the C and the D. So we measure actually the resistance of the heating element. So between pins C and D on the connector we'll measure and that should be around 9 ohms or 9.6 ohms. So that's the first test we're going to do. The second test uh, we can't do uh, with, the uh, with the connector disconnected uh, and we'll have to use some um, test leads, stuff like this. You know, you can get all these little wires and we'll stick them in the pins in the back. So while we connect the connector back then we can actually measure the voltages while the engine is running. So that's the next test, that's the dynamic test. But first of all, let me show you how we're gonna measure the resistance. All right, so bear with me and we go into the bike and then let me show you that up close on how we are going to do this. This is the, pl this is the plug coming from the oxygen sensor uh, which is fitted on the exhaust and this attachment fits in a hole right on the frame there. So you need to prime it out a bit with a screwdriver and once you got it out then you can pull back the whole thing a bit and you see the connector here. This is the connector where this oxygen sensor connects to. This part of the connector is going to the ECU and this part is going to your um, oxygen sensor. Now just look inside the plug here and if you remember what I showed you on the diagram, then the pins are A, B, C, D. So from left to right, A, B, C, D. And when you hold the plug with those plastic uh, guides downwards. So we need to measure with a uh, ohm meter between the two outer pins. So pin this pin and the second pin. So which is pin C and D. So let us do that. So we've got the voltmeter set up. It's set to the low range. Uh, Here's the connector that we disconnected and it's coming from the oxygen sensor. The two outer pins, this one and that one, is where we need to measure. That is where we should me measure 9 ohms resistance. So let's check it out and I hope I will be able to hold it and you guys can see it. It's not always that easy. 
and I measure 9 ohms. That's exactly what we want. So now the next test is going to be measuring between the pin A and B, which are the extreme left two pins. And this is actually the black and gray cable. That's where we'll measure the five volts and the oxygen return uh, from the sensor. So while we're playing with the throttle and the load on the, on, on the bike, you'll see the voltage changing. But therefore we need to reconnect it and I'll need to extend those two wires. And I'll do this with some needles. All right, so I pushed in two small copper uh, pins. So you can also use needles if you want, but be careful. And I pushed it in on the gray and the black wire. And the only thing you need to do now is to make sure that if you put a meter on, an ohm meter on the pin inside, that it actually um, provides connectivity to the one outside because otherwise you're not going to have a proper reading and this one is and the second one is not doing it so the second one I don't have contact so you got to make sure you have contact because otherwise now I have it so you need to push them deep enough otherwise you won't have contact and make sure that you get no shorts and now we are basically ready to connect it back to the original connector and then we will we'll start to measure on those two pins all right so we'll put the connectors back together in the right um, direction and they are keyed so you can't really miss like so It locked, you can hear the click. All right guys, so for the next dynamic test, uh, it's a bit hard to the voltmeter, so you're better off with the smaller oscilloscope. You can buy those very cheap as well. I mean, I got this one for 60 euros and it's quite handy. So you attach the probe to the two test pins we provided on the connector. We reconnected the connector. And now you see the line here, and I'll explain that to you in a few minutes, what's gonna happen with this. So we're gonna start up the bike and you will see the line shooting up, which is indication that the oxygen sensor is getting ready uh, to provide data. As, as soon as I crank up the engine, you'll see that this line will start changing a bit. So as soon as I then add a bit of throttle, uh, the line actually will drop down a bit, and if I let go, the line will go up again. So that's the uh, air fuel mixture adjustment signal that's been sent back to the ECU coming from the oxygen sensor, sometimes called the lambda sensor. So let me give you a close up on this oscilloscope and then you can see what I mean. Uh, if you don't have an oscilloscope, it's going to be hard because it's a varying voltage and your voltmeter might not be able to catch it. So you really need a little oscilloscope to do this. If you have a big one, so much the better. But you can buy these from Velamon. They are quite cheap and quite handy. If you do bike repair, I think it's unavoidable uh, to have some of those test tools. So as you can tell, we've got the oscilloscope hooked up to the um, connector and we bring out the two test leads, mainly pin A and B. And the oscilloscope is set to um, 5 milli, 5, 0.5 volts per division and auto timing. So we don't need to do anything special on that one. So now we're gonna crank up the engine and see what happens uh, with the trace. Um, I will put the uh, video camera closer to the scope so you can actually see what happens. Meanwhile, I will be talking and you will be hearing the sound of the bike. All right, so uh, let me show you how that works real quick. So we got the oscilloscope running and we've got it running. I'm going to turn on the ignition on the bike and we'll start the bike. And you see the curve going and each time I throttle a bit, you can see that the curve is actually going down. See that? So each time I'm demanding power, the sensor flags it and the ECU will provide more power. So that is how that works. Okay fellows, we are done. We checked the oxygen sensor or the lambda on the exhaust and uh, we checked it both statically for the heater and we, it, we checked it dynamically so that it reacts actually with a running engine. And this is how we do it. Uh, you will need a little oscilloscope 
and you will need a voltmeter to do all this work but that's worthwhile the investment if you're serious about working on your Brixton and once you're all done disconnect everything you know all the test leads and then put the connector properly back put the shielding on and lock it back in place onto the frame and you're all set and done and you're ready for a happy ride so thank you for viewing and keep on watching because more is coming bye bye